We have two scripture lessons this morning, and I don't know if it seems unusual when I read them in advance, but I'm going to because they're so critical. We're going to start in the book of Ephesians, jump to a shorter book in the reading in the book of 2 Timothy. So Ephesians chapter 2, the verse 10 verses. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Then from the book of 2 Timothy, Paul writes, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me, let me start this morning by reminding you um, something I mentioned last week. I suggested um, a couple of different study Bibles for you to consider using if um, you don't have one you're using very well, uh, the uh, English Standard Version and the New International Version of Study Bibles. I know they're kind of beasts. They're just, if you went back there, they're big physical books. I know that. Um, but, you know, they have great information, you know, just right under the biblical text and a lot of great sort, uh, resources in there. Stuff I will help you think it will, will help you instantly understand parts of the text that you struggle with or might need a little explanation. So again, I have put them in the, on, on a table in the fellowship hall. If you'd like to take a look at them and see if one of them will work for you, um, let me simply add this morning that if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I don't need another Bible because I don't read the one I have. Um, that's a big problem, and I think you'll grow if you think you'll grow in your relationship with God. With just the 22 minutes you get with me on a Sunday morning, well, you're dead wrong. So take a look at him. Let's uh, get started with our video clip this morning as we uh, talk about sola gratia. The biblical concept of grace alone is as necessary today as it has always been. As human beings, we have a proclivity toward seeking to earn favor with God. That was not just an issue with the Reformation but that's an issue with humanity. This is an issue that the religions of the world pick up on, the idea that if we just do certain things, then God would have favor on us. Or if we follow a certain path or believe certain things, then God will have favor on us. But the reality is, is that salvation has always been by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the fact that it's a gift of God is a message that resounds with a humanity that is seeking, striving, trying to reach for God. And it is a message of good news that God has done everything for us that we need for salvation. And he offers it to us as a gift. Let me start this morning by telling you a story I know I've told you before. It happened about 25 years ago. I was a, an associate pastor at the First Presbyterian Church in Westminster, California. There was a young woman attending church there. It was about 25 years old. I didn't know her very well. She was only involved on Sunday mornings. 
But one of my responsibilities was, was young adults, so I tried to interact with her when I could. One day, she actually sought me out uh, to excitedly tell me about something that had happened just a few days before. She had a grandmother who was very ill. Actually, she was in a hospital with a terminal disease. Now, according to her, all her life, her grandmother had been a bitter, nasty, unpleasant woman who had never had anything to do with God. However, somehow both this young woman and her own mother had become Christians, and they were deeply concerned over Granny's salvation. So for years, they had talked with her about accepting Jesus, and in these past weeks of hospitalization, uh, they talked with her, actually pleaded with her on a daily basis to accept Jesus as her Lord. However, she had never showed any interest at all until a few days before. After another set of urgent pleas from both mother and granddaughter, she finally exasperatedly said, All right, I accept Jesus. Well, both mother and granddaughter were jubilant. She's in now, the granddaughter said to me. She can't take it back, can she? She's going to be in heaven. Now, let me tell you, even as an associate pastor, I knew better to even suggest at that moment that God might require a little more than Granny's half-hearted assent to Jesus. I don't duck quick enough to tell anyone their grandmother might actually be going to hell. Um, but it did get me thinking about a question whose answer is more nuanced than you might think. I mean, what does it take to become a Christian? Some people believe it is simply that at some point in your life, you pray something like, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and that's it. It's a done deal from that point. In fact, some people derisively, uh, but I think appropriately, call this decisionism. You know, is, is that how we receive the grace of God, or is it something deeper? If the most important thing in Scripture is the story of how fallen humanity can be restored to eternal fellowship with God by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, naturally it follows that the second most important thing must be how people are restored. That is, as we say, saved. A word actually we use all the time without thinking much about it. You know, we find that word saved about 100 times in the New Testament and an additional 25 times as the noun savior. It's a pretty common word. I started this series with a story of how I eventually became convinced over time that my own coming to faith and salvation was purely a gift from God alone, it was not the result of any good or merit or intelligence or decision or anything else that I actually was able to bring to it. It was grace alone or as we say in Latin, sola gratia. And we are now in this series on the Reformation solas, into the heart of the series. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus. Only grace, only faith, only Christ. Three deeply interrelated and critical elements of our salvation. And I will tell you that even in three sermons, I will barely be able to touch the shallows of the great depths of these truths. I will say that this week's reading in our book is actually very good at presenting the basics of the first soul, salvation sola, and that is grace. Let me put my, uh, my church history hat on for just a bit. It looks something like this. Uh, there's always been a great debate on how exactly we're saved. In the fourth century, the great theologian Augustine was perhaps the very first to very firmly and very clearly articulate the view that a thousand years later would become associated with Calvinism and Reformed theology. And that is that salvation or grace comes from God alone and to which sinful humans not only contribute nothing, but because they are so lost in their own sin, are unable to contribute anything that would save them. In fact, I tell you, if you went on our trip to Greece and Rome this last week, uh, this last uh, October, um, I actually took you, you probably didn't even know this, to Roman's ancient seaport of Osti Antigua because it was here that Augustine last saw his critically influential dear mother Monica. And she died as they were traveling to Africa here. This was a, kind of a, a, a poignant place for him. At any rate, Augustine wrote, the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord must be understood as that by which alone men are delivered from evil. 
and without which they do absolutely no good thing, whether in thought or will and affection, whether in thought or will and affection or in deed. That's Augustine, 4th century. Now, in response to this, a British monk named Pelagius began to dispute Augustine, asserting he thought that humans had both free will and the moral ability to either choose to do good or evil, to follow God or not to follow God by their own will and strength. It was by individual choice and willpower that humans either chose to follow God or not to follow God. Now, that has simply uh, come to be called Pelagianism. Uh, since then, I know it's a big word, but it's actually a word worth knowing because Pelagianism is functionally the belief that many people have today when it comes to God. I can be good enough on my own to earn my salvation, and I do it by my own free will. There are a lot of people who believe that. I would note that if this was true, there would have been no need for Jesus to come and die on the cross for us. Wait till Solus Crestus for more on that. Now, while Pelagianism was condemned at the time, uh, and I might add, um, simply considered non-Christian by most of Christianity, then and now, many systems arose that thought to marry these two opposite ideas together, that effective grace comes from God, but that humans also contribute something to their salvation in the process. This is often called either synergy or semi-Pelagianism, human divine cooperation in our salvation. Now, this is attractive from the human point of view for a number of reasons, but let me just point out two. One, because it makes us seem like we're not as completely bad as we are and that we're still smart enough and strong enough to choose to follow God. Even though it takes what some people call prevenient grace from God to help us do so. If that's for me, I'm not here. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Doesn't that kind of agree with our fallen ego's idea of self-importance? We're not really all that bad. You know, we can kind of help God with the process. But you know, it's equally attractive and I think even more attractive because what it does is it takes some of the heat off God. I mean, after all, if salvation is by grace alone, a totally free gift of God, who gives it to whom God chooses, then we run into an idea that we all kind of instinctively hate. And it is predestination. Now, mind you, that the same idea that's presented in Scripture uh, that we find in predestination is still there when you see words in a text like elect, or election, or called, or chosen, or even others. Start looking for those words when you read the Bible. You'll be surprised at how often you find them. I've told you that my acceptance of this kind of sovereignty of God or Reformed theology and Calvinism was a long process. And I have to tell you that this was my main stumbling block. Even after I accepted that God alone was responsible for my turning to Jesus Christ in faith, I somehow still wanted to believe that any idea of God choosing to save um, solely by God's own free will and judgment, apart from any person's actions or acceptance, must be some basic misunderstanding and read, misreading of Scripture. In fact, I have to tell you, uh, I found it amusing that I shared my misgivings with, uh, with the preeminent preacher of Calvinism in our day, R.C. Sproul. I'm not quoting him a lot, but he has a lot to say here. Uh, Sproul wrote this. He said, the very word predestination has an ominous ring to it. It's linked to the despairing notion of fatalism and somehow suggests that we are all reduced to meaningless puppets. Add to the horror of the word predestination, the public image of its most famous teacher, John Calvin, a stern and grim-faced tyrant. And we shudder all the more. I fought against it tooth and nail all the way through college. But then Sproul and I would read scriptures like the ones we led this morning that are simply more than clear about God's role and the effect of his grace in our salvation and our lack of role in our salvation. And believe me, start reading through the scriptures. It's there everywhere. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God not by work, so no one can boast. In Christ we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity 
with the purpose of his will. For God foreknew, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the likeness of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. And very simple words from Jesus. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you to go and bear fruit. And again from scriptures. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of God's own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Kind of hard to miss the point, isn't it? Sola gratia, all over the pages. In fact, I'll tell you, um, years ago I went to a conference at the time, the fastest growing in most evangelical church at the time in the country, Willow Creek in Chicago. And, and I went there, and I was going through their bookstore, and I saw a cassette tape of a sermon by Bill Hybels entitled Predestination. And I instantly bought it, thinking, Bill is going to explain this all to me in a way that's going to preserve our human response to God and free me up from this confusion. And I didn't even have a tape player in my 1983 Toyota Land Cruiser, so I had to wait till I got home to listen to it. And guess what? Bill preached on Ephesians 1 and sections out of Romans. And as he came to the end of the sermon, he simply said, okay, predestination is a biblical thing. We have to take it seriously, even if we don't fully understand it, because it's clearly taught in the Bible, and it has to be true. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Just what I needed. And honestly, sola scriptura collided with sola gratia, and I could resist no longer. And anyway, I have to tell you, any Calvinist will tell you that grace is irresistible. Um, okay, that's funny. Come on. Um, <laughs> now, friends, I'll tell you, I still struggle a bit with some of the, uh, the details, but not with the basic elements because they are so biblical and ultimately so foundational. We all are fallen. We are all self-centered. Of our own accord and our own will, we will always choose what gives our fallen self-centeredness the most delight. And that is never giving ourselves completely to God. We cannot change our hearts of stone to hearts of flesh by our own decisions or by our own actions. We cannot save ourselves. We need God's grace to do that. And we need to understand this because it helps us understand how very much God loves us even in the midst of our own sinfulness and continued folly and absolute helplessness. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Martin Luther, who, who wrote more about this than Calvin ever did, would write this. He said, But a man cannot be thoroughly humbled until he realizes that his salvation is utterly beyond his own powers, counsels, efforts, will, and works. and depends absolutely on the will, counsel, pleasure, and works of another. God alone. Sola gratia. Now, friends, there are about a million things left to say about this. Um, and we'll continue these conversations in the next several sermons. But let me just finish with three final thoughts this morning. Maybe not even the most important things to say. But I know that many evangelicals, um, whom most of us count ourselves, say that they believe in a sovereign God and in sola gratia for human salvation and then functionally become Pelagians when it comes to guiding people to God simply calling on them to make a decision for Christ or to live for God. And it's true that the greatest means of God's grace in our salvation is the preaching of the gospel in many forms. And that in a way that we cannot entirely get our arms around, that God does indeed offer salvation to all people. And that's what we are called to proclaim in season and out of season, God's call and promise of a new life in Jesus Christ. 
Yet if we leave a new follower of Christ thinking that they have been saved by anything other than the pure grace of God, then we really start them off on the wrong foot, don't we? Presenting to them a God who is less than sovereign and a grace that is only partly a gift. And that's a mistake. One that I will tell you I have made myself all too often. The second thing I want to say is this, that we all too often allow things like this, as important as they are, to divide us as the whole Christian church. There's no need for this, and we should not let it. Every great reformer who has held the sola gratia admits that while this is critical for really understanding God and God's grace, that it is not especially something that keeps anyone out of heaven or keeps them from following or serving God. R.C. Sproul calls this an intramural debate. I love what the great Calvinist preacher Charles Spurgeon said about John Wesley. You might know John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church, the Wesleyan movement, who believed in a form of of what many people believe is semi-Pelagianism called Arminianism. I have that listed in one of your outlines if you want to look at it a little bit later. Uh, He was an Arminian when it came to grace and salvation. He believed that God gave provenient grace to, to help people accept him. And yet Spurgeon writes this about him, and I love it. He says, there's no soul living who holds more firmly to the doctrines of grace than I do. And if any man asks whether I'm ashamed to be called a Calvinist, I answer, I wish to be called nothing more but a Christian. But if you ask me, do I hold to the doctrinal views which are held by John Calvin? I reply, I do in the main hold them and rejoice to avow them. But far be it from me to imagine that Zion contains none but Calvinistic Christians within her walls, or that there are none saved who do not hold to our views. Most atrocious things have been spoken about the character and spiritual condition of John Wesley, the modern prince of Arminians. I can only say concerning him that while I detest many of the doctrines which he preached, yet for the man himself, I have a reverence second to no Wesleyan. If there were needed two apostles to be added to the number of the twelve, I could not believe that there could be found two men more fit to be added than George Whitehead and John Wesley. The character of John Wesley stands above all imputation for self-sacrifice, zeal, holiness, and communion with God. He lived far above the ordinary level of common Christians and was one of whom the world was not worthy. And he continues and says, I believe there are multitudes of men who cannot see the truths of Calvinism, or at least cannot see them in the way that we put them, who nevertheless have received Christ as their Savior and are as dear to the heart of God of grace as the soundest Calvinist in or out of heaven. We need to understand that while this is true, it is not something that we use to continue to divide the Christian church. Finally, let me add this to you this morning. I think sola gratia is critically important because this is the one truth that fully and completely teaches you how much God loves you and how freely God gives you that love. I think many of you have shared with me the the wonderful experience of watching your child be born. And I think most of you have shared my my same experience at that time, just as soon as that child appears, having done nothing more than making their mom miserable for hours and showing up and crying with all their breath, you instantly love them, don't you? In fact, you love them so much that you would willingly trade your life for theirs if the need suddenly arose. Now, that's as close as we humans get to sola gratia in our lives. And it is this unmerited love that follows our kids through their life. Do any of you think for a moment that we love more purely or more freely than God does? Our love is but a shadow of the love God has for us. And that free grace that God gives us needs to influence and mold every part of our life. Sol gratia, fully understood and accepted, really changes every part of us. So do you worry if God really loves you? I mean, or do you worry that God will grant you this grace or pass you by? Well, we'll talk more about that in a week. But let me simply say that if you find a place in your heart that yearns to love and serve and follow Jesus alone as your Lord and your Savior, then you don't need to worry. God put that there. God has taken away your heart of stone. So la gratia is at work in you. God being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us made us alive when we were dead.
and it is by his grace that we have been saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your grace really is, as we sing, amazing. That it came to us not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, not because we helped it in any way, but because you chose to love us. And Lord, we know that love can change everything in us. So help us to hear the call of the Holy Spirit when it comes and to respond to you as our Lord and our Savior, the one who saved us from before the beginning of time, that we might be with him and love him forever. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Let's put a good, strong amen on that and sing together Amazing Grace. Let's all stand. One, two. Everybody. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved But now I am found, was blind, but now I see. As grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour i first believed who many dangers toils and snares I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no last days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun.